This computer graphic explains the collapse in detail. The suspended walkways spanned the Hyatt's lobby at three levels. The third floor walkway hung by itself. The second floor walkway hung directly below the fourth floor walkway. The fourth floor walkway was supported by six ceiling mounted rods. As originally designed, these rods bore the weight of both linked walkways. A cutaway detail of the walkway reveals how its weight was supported by a metal box beam. The walkway structure was composed of a steel framework of I-beams that were joined together to form the sides of the walkways. Supporting them, the box beam would then be connected to the ceiling mounted rod that would actually bear the weight. This vital connection between the box beam and the ceiling rod proved to be the critical area of weakness in the walkways. The original design called for a single rod connection, which meant that each connection only bore the weight of one walkway. However, the way the walkways were built ended up doubling the load borne at the fourth floor level. Something supposed to hold one walkway ended up carrying the weight of two. Over time, this weight tore the box beam steel apart until both walkways fell away from the supporting ceiling rod and collapsed to the floor. The addition of a simple stiffener or reinforcing plate within the box beam at any point in the process would probably have prevented the collapse. Had the stiffener been included with the detail and included inside the, the tube, the box beam, it would never have a, a collapsed. Or, as an alternative to that, a large plate on the bottom, had it been included there, would never have it would have carried the load and would never have collapsed. At that point in time, we estimated that the cost of a plate would have been $1. So for six hangers, you would have had a $6 cost. The money was, was never an issue in the design of the connection. It was, it was just a, a poor, poor choice by the engineer from day one. The most important lessons to learn from the Hyatt are is that each individual has to be responsible for what he does. Two, that you have to follow up any problems that occur Three, that you have to have be, you have to have communication up and down. You have to talk about it. You have to follow up every problem that occurs, as I said once before, that the, um, <clears throat> every individual has to assume responsibility for what he does and don't assume anything. In other words, when I say don't assume anything, I mean that every individual responsible for doing something on our project cannot assume he has to check his own work. You have to check your own work. Don't assume somebody else will do it. Basically what the NBS report concluded was that the channels would fail at a, at a load of around 18,000 pounds. That the required design loading on the on the thing to meet building codes was somewhere over 40,000 pounds that it should have been designed, designed for, and that the ultimate capacity of that connection to meet building code would have been 68,000 pounds. So basically you had something that, that should have been designed to fail at 68,000 pounds, failing at, at 18,000 pounds. So they, they, were, they were almost a factor of 400 percent off in their, in their design. I do remember that as a result of that, uh, there was a drastic reorganization of uh, the codes enforcement and the building inspectors of Kansas City, and they were told, look, this is not a cushy job. Your job is to inspect the buildings. Do your job, because there was a great feeling that they weren't doing their work. Kansas City changed, became a department uh, regarding this type of business and raise the professional level. They reorganized, they formed a separate department, the Department of Codes Administration. Another thing that we did is we formed a, um, a special inspections branch. That, that happened when I was here. When a building like the Hyatt comes through for review, we dub that because the nature of the building, one that will require special inspections. Regarding a guarantee that another Hyatt could not collapse, we couldn't do that. There's no code official that would ever give you that type of guarantee. 
no matter how high you raise the professional level in your department, there's always something that could happen. The bottom line is that you had a, you had a human failure here. It, it didn't relate to codes, it didn't relate to intelligence, it didn't relate to, to anything that needs to be corrected. It was just that somebody didn't pay attention and they needed to. The final buck stops with me because I was the engineer of record. And that, you know, that was established by law. In this state particularly, it was established by law. We spent the whole night working underneath the third skywalk. It was still a, attached to the roof, not knowing if it was going to fall or not. I thought about pulling them back, but to be honest with you, I don't think I could have. I could have shouted and screamed and gave orders all night long, but they were so intent on rescue that there wasn't enough of me to physically pull every one of them out of the way. They assured us that the Hyatt, the remaining structures in the Hyatt were were safe, and then later on that evening they said, oops, we were wrong, there were some areas that weren't safe. We started using Hearst tools that we had then to try and lift up one side of, of the skywalks in order to, because you could hear the people inside, you knew they were in there. It, it was breaking some of the Hearst tools, but we managed to get three or four under and, and lifted a few inches and then put a piece of cribbing under and then stack and go from there, which allowed us to get underneath and we, there was a number of us that crawled in. It got to be so risky that I finally had to give the orders not to do that anymore until we got some real good wood cribbing or, or something that would really stabilize it because I didn't want any of the firefighters um, trapped in there if that Skywalk ever came down again. In those times, uh, and that was in 81, we weren't aware of a, like uh, some of the universal precautions that we normally take with, with AIDS and all these other different things that these exposures that we come in contact with. So we were crawling through it and uh, covered with it with blood and water and everything you can imagine, body fluids. Wouldn't even think of that now. I mean, that, that, that'd be a huge concern in today's line, of, in today's environment. Big boys don't cry, and we handle our own problems. In the fire service, in the fire service that I was in, we handled our own problems, and, and uh, going to somebody whining about what had happened was not one of the ways you handle the problem. You, you just, you suck it in and you go on. And uh, so I never, in answer to your question, I never received any counseling or anything. It's simply because I chose not to. It wasn't because it wasn't available. They made it available to, for us. And I just chose not to because of that macho thing. We're all our own peer counselors. Um, we help each other. And, and if somebody's having problems, I'll go to their house, you know, or we'll go out and you're not supposed to, but I'll go out and have a beer with them and we'll talk, you know. Uh, CISD wants you to go have fruit juice and healthy stuff where, you know, firemen want to go have a beer and a whiskey, you know. But uh, no, we're, we're our own counselors. Essentially, the idea of, uh, of the critical incident stress debriefing was that notion that if we did something prophylactic and immediate and involved everybody, that somehow we would be able to, to find a way to head off those earlier difficulties. It was a very naive approach to a very complicated problem. And like most naive approaches to complicated problems, it's had to be refined a great, great deal since then. But the one thing that we have discovered most critically about the debriefing process itself is that it does not reliably prevent folks from going on to develop post-traumatic stress disorder, but it does, in fact, have the tendency for a few but a significant number of folks to retard their natural ability to recover using whatever means they would normally have at their disposal by trying to put them into a box into which they don't fit. First of all, I, I didn't think that somebody that wasn't there 
could tell me much about what and how I should feel. And after this, I spent 14 hours down there that, um, I was there about 14 hours down at the high that particular night. And I, the next day I went back to the station after 14 hours and I went home. And I stayed home four or five hours, maybe not that long. And I went back to the fire station because that's where the people were that I had been with all night and I could talk to and the guys that, that relieved us down there. And I just felt comfortable being in that environment uh, as opposed to being at home with, you know, trying to explain, telling my wife. And, and I never took my job home with me, so I, I certainly didn't want to take that home with me. We've also learned that the people who provide the best help to firefighters are people who deal with them every day and people who are a part of that system and deal with it effectively. For example, some of the things that we have learned in 20 years of serious study are that if you want to control the stress of a critical incident like this, first control the incident. That is, how commanders manage and stage and execute the operation is far more important to how people feel walking away from it than simply the sights or the sounds or the events of that. And in a series of partition studies now, we have come to learn just how important that is. I'd prefer not to think about it. Um, you know, it's a very traumatic thing. Um, you know, a lot of people got injured and a lot of people were killed that probably shouldn't have been. And if I had to do over again, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been there. When the Hyatt Regency happened, uh, the counseling or whatever afterwards was non-existent. So it's left an indelible mark on me and whoever was uh, there. Uh, but now if somebody's involved in something that they feel like they need help with, um, then they're brought in and they're consoled or, or they kind of go through um, grief counseling, you know, so that they can better understand and better deal with um, what happened and trying to deal with it on their own like we did. In hindsight, I'm not sure that I ever got well from that. And I think that counseling would have been the way for me now I can see that perhaps it I would have extended my career in the fire service had I, had I just uh, exercised the options that were placed before me. I, I think I would highly recommend any time that you're in a traumatic situation or something that's that devastating, that, that, that affects your whole psyche, then you, all, you should go and get all the help that's available to you. One of the lessons learned of the Hyatt was that there needs to be critical incident stress debriefing or counseling for these traumatic type events for not only the victims but for the rescuers, all those involved, whether they be lay people who volunteered and stayed, whether they be healthcare professionals, whether they be hardened physicians. We've learned is that uh, the things that cause you the greatest stress are often the things you were carrying around the day before. Epidemiologically speaking, the one thing that best predicts what shape you'll be in two years after exposure to something like this is the shape you were in two days before. We've made great strides in making available to our employees uh, assistance programs that they can utilize confidentially and without cost for any issues going on in their lives at any time.